Hello and willkommen. Welcome to Aid and Eyewitness. Two years after starting the Aid and Eyewitness channel, I'm able to present my first Made in Germany video. My original plan was to explore cities over here and over there, but travel was restricted. But now it's possible, so I'm able to go ahead with my plan. This first video focuses on construction and restoration in Berlin. Watch out also for my short promo on my online classes in German language. So let's go down to the gate now for the two hour flight to Berlin. We have arrived at BER Berlin Brandenburg Airport. Completion was delayed by nine years. It opened on the 31st of October 2020. It's massive and it looks almost empty, but that's deceptive. It's actually quite busy and is set to become the third busiest airport in Germany with 34 million passengers per year. Flights this evening, it's a Saturday, are a mixture of European city and leisure destinations. The terminal is sumptuously finished with monumental use of wood, concrete and plate glass. To me, it seems like a gigantic palace, complete with runways, commissioned by some eastern potentate who decided not to move in, and so it was turned into an airport. The reality was less glamorous and more costly. It's named after Willy Brandt, former Berlin mayor and former chancellor of Germany. Outside the terminal, it's quiet, almost deserted. The square is named Willy Brandtplatz, and out there, in the distance, beyond the airport perimeter, is a place called Germany, and we're about to explore. The Kaiser Wilhelm Gedächtniskirche, the Kaiser Wilhelm Memorial Church, is the most famous landmark of what was West Berlin. It's a powerful combination of old and new, it's a functioning church, a monument to the devastation of war, and it's also used for concerts. The old church was built to commemorate Kaiser Wilhelm I, United Germany's first head of state. It came together in 1871. Construction was between 1895 and 1906. Four decades later, in 1943, it was damaged, though not completely destroyed, in an air raid. The symbol of German unification became the symbol of German annihilation. After some disagreement over what to do with the ruin, architect Egon Eiermann won the competition to redevelop the site. Initially, he wanted to demolish the old tower, but after a public outcry, he produced an amended design, the one we see today. Next to the ruined octagonal tower, a modern hexagonal church with a flat roof was built. A bell tower of similar design was placed on the other side of the ruined tower, plus two smaller buildings. It was called by locals the Lippenstift und Puderdose, the lipstick and powder box. I've heard people say they don't like the modern church, but I find it dramatic and perfect for the site. Most impressive is the effect of the 21,292 stained glass windows set into the honeycomb walls. Inside, the blue gives a special atmosphere, and at night the windows glow to the inside and to the outside, thanks to lamps between the inner and outer walls. The ruined base of the old church contains many artefacts, including a cross of nails from Coventry Cathedral. Like many groundbreaking modern buildings, it has needed extensive renovation and work is in progress on the bell tower to counter the destructive effects of rust. In 2016, there was a terrorist attack which is permanently commemorated on the steps. The Kaiser Wilhelm Gedächtniskirche is one of Berlin's best loved landmarks and a symbol of how Berlin has spectacularly overcome the devastation of war. Just next to the Kaiser Wilhelm Church, at the focal point of what we now call City West, a new kid has arrived on the block. It was a few years ago, 2017 to be precise. A tall individual with a curvy exterior, full of interesting facets and shapes, and a look that's unique and classy. Upper West, 118 meters tall, arguably just enough to be a skyscraper, 33 stories, fourth tallest in Berlin. There are shops in the base, a motel one as far as the 19th floor, and above that, offices. A sky bar was planned but never built. This new kid has a companion. It's the Saufenster, or Window on the Zoo, and it's located across the street, also 118 meters, 32 stories, and it's given as the fifth tallest building in Berlin. It's based around more conventional rectangular forms, though arranged in an interesting way. 
The glazed upper floors have views over Berlin Zoo and the historic central area. Inside, there's a five-star Waldorf Astoria Hotel, as well as offices and shops. Earlier 60s buildings, including one that spanned the street, were demolished to make way for both newcomers. At first sight, I wasn't too keen on this pair, sticking out above the skyline I remember. I wished they would go away, but now I've come to appreciate them. This glamorous couple can be seen all over Berlin. They've become established on the skyline. We're going to head east now to look at the Bauhaus archive, and we're walking along by the canal. But uh, what's this? A construction site. Let's take a closer look. Berlin Hoop. Nothing to do with hypnosis. Berlin Hoop is a bank specializing in real estate development. Hypothek means mortgage. Werte schaffen, Werte leben. Create values, live values. Partners are not Manchester-based BDP Architects, but BDP Real Estate Berlin. Architects, C.F. Meller. Here's the visualization. With its exterior framework of white concrete pillars and beams, it reminds me of the office building that replaced the Odin Cinema on Oxford Street, Manchester. Is there such thing as a Berlin style of architecture? Or a Manchester style of architecture? We're about to look at a place that has a close connection with an architectural movement called the International Style. It's had a huge impact on architecture worldwide. This is the site of the Bauhaus archive, but at the moment it's a building site. A new tower is under construction which will house museum exhibits. Thoughtfully, they've built a temporary viewing tower where visitors can observe progress. There are no staff or security guards, you just walk in and go up the stairs. You wouldn't find that in Manchester. Exhibits show how the new building is going to look. With its plain functional aesthetic, the Bauhaus was hugely influential in the 20th century in architecture, design, art and craft. It operated from 1919 until it was shut down by the Nazis in 1933. Its founders emigrated all over the world. Mies van der Rohe went to Chicago. After the war, a Bauhaus museum was planned for the city of Darmstadt. Architect Walter Gropius produced the plans, but the location was switched to West Berlin on this site next to the Landwehr Canal. Construction was between 1976 and 1979. Gropius's original 1964 design was altered, though the futuristic curved silhouette of the shed roofs remained. It's one of Berlin's most notable modern style buildings. In 2005, it served as an outdoor set for the science fiction action films V for Vendetta and Eon Flux. And while we're here, let's look across the street at a very interesting building, nothing to do with the Bauhaus. It's the national headquarters of the CDU. That's Angela Merkel's party. Centre-right, conservative, kind of. The architecture is not traditional. Can forward-looking architecture produce forward-looking people? In front of the building, there's a CDU campaign sign. You don't need German to understand their priorities. And what of the architecture of the British Conservative Party at their head office in London? What message does it send out? I'll leave you to draw your own conclusions. As you may have noticed, I love to show people Berlin, and I also love to teach people the German language. I've done it for many years. You can learn with me in online classes using a fresh approach I've developed. I call it Turbo German. One-to-one -one or group, beginner or intermediate. Email german at aiden.co.uk. That's german at aiden.co.uk. The Neue Nationalgalerie was the last building designed by Ludwig Mies van der Rohe. He was born in Germany, emigrated to the US, and became one of the most famous architects of the modern style. It's a very large glass and steel pavilion mounted on a podium with huge floor-to-ceiling windows on all four sides. The roof weighs 1,260 tons. In the windows, surrounding buildings are reflected, including the Matthäuskirche, St. Matthew's Church, here reflecting the sound of the bells. The Neue Nationalgalerie opened in 1968. It was built not far from the Berlin Wall, in an empty, undeveloped area on the margins of West Berlin. I just love the plainness and symmetry of the Neue Nationalgalerie, here complementing the curves of the sculpture Tête et Queue, or Heads and Tail in French, by Alexander Calder. Like many groundbreaking buildings, it needed renovation. It was closed for five years and reopened in 2021. Original estimated cost, 101 million euro. Final cost for the repairs, 140 million, paid for entirely by the federal government. Inside, the space is virtually empty. 
There are no pillars, so it can be used for all kinds of exhibitions and artworks. Here's a living artwork entitled Huddle. It's a kind of entrance foyer for the main exhibition areas in the basement, which house mostly 20th century art up to the 1960s. For me, this is pure architecture, with almost nothing inside, a kind of gigantic folly. But the city outside becomes a kind of exhibit, framed in those huge windows. In the distance, we can see the towers on the Potsdamer Platz, and on the right, the Staatsbibliothek, or State Library. The ceiling is impressive too, with its square forms inset with lamps. A new building is now under construction next door to extend the exhibition space. It's the Museum of the 20th Century and it'll be linked to the Nationalgalerie by an underground walkway. It will quadruple the available space. Let's hope the costs don't spiral out of control. Next, we're going to take the S-Bahn to Potsdam, capital of Brandenburg Federal State, about half an hour's ride from the centre of Berlin, where we're going to see the Einstein Tower that's not the Einstein Tower, it's the Nikolaikirche in Potsdam town centre. Can we take a tram? No, no, there's no tram. Bus? No, that one's going to Sans Souci Palace, that's where all the tourists go, and we don't want to go there. We could hire a bike or take a taxi, but let's walk. It's located in the Wissenschaftspark Albert Einstein, or Science Park, on the Telegrafenberg, or mountain, 1.7 kilometers along Albert Einsteinstraße. It's quite a long and mostly uphill walk, but it'll be well worth it to take lots of photos and video clips of Germany's most fascinating and most intriguing building renovation project, currently completely covered in scaffolding. Hmm, should have checked that out in advance, but never mind. In a glass case next to it, there's a model of the Einstein Tor. It's an astrophysical observatory built a hundred years ago, designed by architect Erich Mendelssohn to support experiments connected with Einstein's theory of relativity. Later, he changed his name to Eric and emigrated to the US, as Einstein himself did in 1933. America's gain was Germany's loss. There's the telescope, designed by German astronomer Erwin Findlay Freundlich, who fled to Scotland in 1939 and taught at St Andrews University. Here's how it looked when I came here in 2004. Its architectural style is expressionist. That's an artistic movement more famous for painting and poetry. But here, it supports a scientific purpose. I like that. Art and science working together. I think the design is marvellous, but Einstein? didn't like it. It was groundbreaking in its use of concrete, and like all groundbreaking concrete designs, there were problems. Here it is during the first set of repairs, during 1927. Let's hope this latest restoration will secure the building for the future. I'll be back when it's finished. I'm going to finish with a tribute to the Berlin S-Bahn, or City Railway, part of the rail network inside Berlin, which extends out into the surrounding Brandenburg Federal State. It's run by Deutsche Bahn, German Railways. 342 kilometers, nearly 3,000 employees, 168 stations, 687 electric two-carriage units, 900,000 passengers per day during the week. Figures from S-Bahn, Berlin. On stations and passageways in the central area, archive photographs, documents and artworks help to keep Berlin's incredible history ever-present. There's no attempt here to present a PR-approved modern image. Some stations are in a contemporary architectural style, others retain a pre-war charm. Yes, there are sometimes delays. <laughs> Die derzeitige Verspätung unseres Zuges beträgt zwölf Minuten. Nächster Fahrplan, wie sie gehalten ist. But those red and yellow ochre trains with their distinctive sound just keep moving and moving every day, around the clock, and they have been doing for over a century, apart from a short disruption in mid-1945, due to something that was going on at the time. And as we sit in the carriage looking out the window, I think of a song by David Bowie's Berlin flatmate, Iggy Pop. It's called The Passenger. I can't play the song for copyright reasons, there's a link in the description. It's one of my favourite songs. The video features scenes of Berlin. Riding the S-Bahn is like going on a journey in time through Berlin's past, present and future. The S-Bahn is not just a means of getting from A to B. It's part of the Berlin experience. I hope you found this video interesting, maybe even inspiring. Please like and share. 
post a comment and subscribe to the channel to receive all notifications. Vielen Dank fürs Zuschauen, thank you very much for watching and Auf Wiedersehen in der wunderbaren Stadt Berlin.